you know, the, the, the thing is about uh, Hillary Clinton, and uh, first of all, what I mentioned, the Kennedys had better taste. And somebody says, well, you know, they didn't do Marilyn Monroe any good, but Marilyn Monroe wasn't forced into any of that. She went into it willingly, quite willingly, with not one but two Kennedy brothers, as we well know. In Bill Clinton's universe, a lot of these women apparently didn't, it, it wasn't, they weren't willing participants. No, not at all. Uh, so there is a, a big difference there. And um, it just seems to me Bill Clinton was like one of those uh, dogs that, as he was governor of Arkansas, you know, anything that came up on the street was worthwhile. Uh, <laughs> perhaps even somebody's leg as he was, you know, you know I, we had, I had an uncle who had a dog that, I'd go to Uncle Dave's house, and that dog fell in love with everybody's legs. I just, and, you know, he just had so much trouble trying to discipline that dog. I, Bill Clinton is a lot like that. And, and, and Hillary Clinton, who was a participant in making these women look bad, you know, if they were indeed violated and a crime was committed and then she turned around and helped cover it up or humiliate them and uh, the bimbo eruptions, as she called that, that I'm telling you right now, Hillary Clinton is fair game. <laughs> yes, yes. I wonder what she would be doing to your legs. Well, she'd be chewing on them. Chew them off, probably. <laughs> or you ever hear the phrase coyote ugly? <laughs> you know what that means? <laughs> I had a friend. He was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, and I think he's still. Well, he may have retired now. Uh, Al Verlay. Uh, if you ever were in the Denver area, uh, you probably heard Al doing traffic reports because he was uh, on television and radio for years uh, during air traffic reports. Al and I worked together in the late 80s and the early 1990s, and one day the fog was so heavy and the rain so heavy, too, that he came in and he, he had to do his traffic reports from inside the studio, which you can do if you have some friends in the police department and sheriff's department who can tell you what's going on on the roads. So Al was sitting there, and he was doing it from a desk, and during one of the breaks he made a reference to somebody being coyote ugly. And I, I mean, I was a young, naive guy. <laughs> no, I didn't. Came from a small town with two traffic lights. And, uh, you know, when I used to hear stories about things like marijuana, I always thought it was like a big gooey block of something. I didn't realize it was something that grew on a plant. And I would just, you know, we, we'd hear. I remember one time shopping with my dad for school clothes, and I saw a jacket that was faux leather. And, and I said, gee, I could wear that. And my dad says, that looks like dope. So I never got one. Uh, <laughs> you know, I got a bomber jacket instead, which was pretty cool. Uh, you know, I looked like I was straight out of World War II. Well, my dad kind of having that reputation as well. But Alver Lay was sitting there talking to me at his desk that day at the radio station. I said, well, what's Coyote Ugly? And he says, he says, well, that's when you've had too much to drink the night before and you don't realize what you came home with. And he said, and you wake up in the morning and see it sleeping on your arm. And then he made a motion like he was chewing his arm off. I hate to tell you this, women. Uh, men do tell jokes like that amongst themselves. Now, they don't necessarily, like Donald Trump, tell them publicly too often, but they do tell themselves jokes like that. And up until that point, I had, I, I'd never heard the phrase coyote ugly. But, but indeed, uh, men, when they're sitting around sometimes in a diner talking over coffee or they're sitting at a gin joint, which some of them do, they tell those kind of jokes. And if they're sitting around and the wives and girlfriends aren't around, that comes up. But then I used to work with a group of nurses, um, putting myself through college, I started in high school, and I worked all the way through the four years of college in a hospital kitchen. And eventually, I graduated to working the cafeteria because uh, the boss said I was really responsible. Boy, did I ever have him hoodwinked. So they took me out, and they put me out in the cafeteria, and I got to know all of the nurses who would come down, and you know, they'd, they'd have, they used to come down in shifts for their dinner, and they'd talk to me while they were getting their dinner and pay me at the uh, cash register and all, and... Uh, Sometimes if it was a little slow, I'd go over and I'd sit at the table and hear their stories about their jobs and the like. But I also got exposed to a lot of their talk, social talk, if you will. Good golly, if you think that the men are a little rough, holy mackerel. Some of the stories that they would tell me, holy. Uh, and I, st I still have some friends uh, from that era. Uh, I was just talking to one of them the other day. Uh, she's a, she was a candy striper at the time. I got to know her when she would come down to the cafeteria and get a glass of milk now and then. And uh, she doesn't even drink. She's one of those people that, you know, she's Southern Baptist and all of that. But uh, she tells me stories. She's still working in nursing, and she tells me stories that sometimes, uh, well, it just, I, 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 I 
she doesn't tell them in a bad way. She just tells me about experiences with patients. But the other women, the jokes they would tell, I mean, if my parents had known, they may have told me to quit. <laughs> you need to work somewhere else, young man. 948, coming up on 949. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com. It's 55. Yeah, so I was sitting around, and these women, you know, were all 10, 20 years older than I was, and I was, and, and they would tell these stories in front of me. I don't think they would tell them to their own children, but they told them to me. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left in the program today, and of course, the telephone number, if you'd like to reach us, is 736-0300. That's 736-0300, and of course, you can also reach us at News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com. There was a whole gaggle of them. They worked like the 3 to 11 o'clock shift, and I'd be out of work by about 8 o'clock. I'd clean up the cafeteria, go home. And when I turned 18 and my buddies and I would start going down to the local uh, neighborhood joint where we would shoot pool, uh, we'd sometimes be there a little after 11 o'clock at night, and that whole group of nurses would all come in, and they'd sit there until closing time. Um, so, yeah, they, <laughs> the Florence Nightingale, they were not. Uh, I'll just uh, be quite honest about all of that. Uh, and, and so, uh, by the way, tomorrow I do want to re reference, if you weren't with us in the first hour of the program, Cliff Katona is scheduled to join us. Uh, if you don't know the man, he is a candidate for Twin Falls County Sheriff. He's retired as a detective from Idaho State Police. He is challenging the incumbent Tom Carter in a primary. Now, we'll be hearing from Tom Carter as well. Uh, what we'll do, though, is Cliff will join us for the very first time on air tomorrow and tell us why it is exactly he plans to challenge the sheriff and why he thinks he could do a better job and then we'll be getting in touch with Sheriff Carter and having him come along, too, as well. Uh, and he'll spend another half hour with us in the studio. A point counterpoint, we'll call it at this point. Also, I have to tell you about my friends at High Desert Meat Processing in Twin Falls, where they process one animal at a time. What, it, what you bring in is exactly what you're going to get back. I have some friends around town who tell me that that is a very important distinction when it comes to meat processing in this area. Darren Van Horn, the owner of High Desert Meat Processing, processing here at Twin Falls. He's been doing this nearly 35 years. You can visit High Desert Meat Processing on Facebook and see reviews from other customers, some of whom have called the radio show and uh, spoke quite highly, too, over the air about, about the work done there. Give High Desert Meat Processing a call for all of your wild game and domestic processing needs. The telephone number 734-9949. High Desert Meat does in-house smoking, and nothing, nothing gets shipped out. Specialty meats, breakfast sausage, brats, Polish dogs, hot dogs, kielbasa, summer sausage, pepperoni, salami, jerky, and much more. USDA approved, and Darren works closely with beef growers, local beef growers. This means the domestic area. And their programs to ensure quality meat, the number 734-9949. Now, the caller called on me to be a bit more Christian. I've got to share a couple of quick things. I, I briefly referenced this earlier in the program. Christian Post, Franklin Graham, Christian Leaders to Hold World Summit in Defense of Persecuted Christians in Moscow. And they're not talking uh, anywhere in Idaho, by the way. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, I've got that sort of right, and the Russian Orthodox Church will be hosting a summit on religious persecution in Moscow, the Reverend Franklin Graham announced. Now, if you recall, his father... Um, you want to talk about a guy who traveled the entire earth. Billy Graham actually ministered in the old Soviet Union. He managed to pry open the doors, and they allowed him to come and preach, even though that government was wholeheartedly atheistic. And that same government, well, under some tyrannical leaders earlier, had closed down a great many Russian Orthodox churches and repudiated the part that the Russian Orthodox Church played in the national culture. And yet they allowed uh, Billy Graham to come and preach. Well, since the fall uh, 25 years ago of the Soviet Empire, not only have we seen Vladimir Putin, but we saw, of course, his predecessor. The two of them allowed the doors of a great many of those Russian Orthodox churches to reopen. Now, they haven't been what you'd call too friendly to a lot of other churches since then, because, again, it's, they've got such a close relationship the church had with the Russian people. But... They do believe, because as Franklin Graham says, in the Russian Orthodox Church, you find a church that was oppressed like no other in the 20th century. So they do believe that it is time now for them to join forces and protect Christians in other parts of the world. I hope there's a declaration about China. 
I'm not so sure there will be because the focus seems to be right now on what's going on in the Middle East with ISIS and in North Africa, you know, where Christians are being burned alive, they're being raped, they're being shot, uh, and, you know, just they're being told, you, the converter, you die. But in China, things aren't any better. You know, Christians there are, are, are I've heard stories where the Chinese, if they practice, uh, well, if they, they find practicing Christians, and there's a couple of other religious faiths that are outlawed as well, uh, you, you can have, for instance, a Christian church in China as long as the state approves of it. For instance, there are Roman Catholic bishops with small flocks in China, but China insists on signing off on the approval of the bishops, which means the bishop is a guy who will never cross the Chinese government. I don't know that the, that's like making a deal with the devil. I, I, so in many cases, those seats go empty. Uh, they, they're not filled by the Roman church. But I was reading this about a year ago, that in China, if especially the, the public bureau that runs the country is comprised of a lot of old, wheezing men. And so they have a lot of problems in the way of kidney failure and, and you know other, other issues. So they're constantly looking for transplants. They have a ready source in people who are of religious uh, backgrounds who are imprisoned because of their religious views and who will not accept that the Chinese government is God. And when they need someone for kidneys or other donated organs, they simply hack these people open and harvest their organs many times without the use of anesthetics because by doing this, the torture, the sheer excruciating pain they put these three people through is supposedly going to convince others not to become religious. Of course, they forget as well that in the early days of the church, that brought more people. If you go to your faith, uh, you go to, to your death, your horrible death, dying for your faith. Yesterday was the anniversary of the 40 martyrs. Some of you may know the story. Uh, in the early days of Christianity, we're going back about almost 1,800 years here, there were some Roman soldiers. There were 40 of them, and they were cr converts to Christianity and this was in the uh, the Crimean region, I believe, that they were serving at the time. Uh, they were in the Eastern world, and it was very it was a very cold uh, winter. And they were told, "Well, you know what? We're going to give you a choice." They stripped them down naked, and the forty were forced to march out onto a frozen lake and stand there. At one point, one of them decided, "Well, this isn't for me," and they put up some warm baths near the lake shore, trying to convince them that you know you give up your faith, you can come here and get a warm bath and get yourself back in shape. So one of them defected, and there were now 39. But one of the Roman guards who was keeping an eye on his fellow troops realized, you know, these guys are willing to die a horrible death. And he took off his, uh, his armor and his gear, and he marched out onto the lake, and he stood with them, making it 40 all over again. The following morning, they came along, and here were the 40 just frozen on the lake. Some of them likely still alive, but barely. And then they took all 40 of them, and they burned them, some of them still alive, obviously. And uh, they, they, they were going to scatter the ashes. Except that some bishops in the region managed to recover some of those ashes. And those ashes ended up being spread across Europe. And wherever those ashes were taken and that story was told, it led to converts. So March 9th was a day that they remembered. That was yesterday. And what's happening in a great many parts of the world is, and I was reading about this the other day, in Iraq and Syria, there are more and more people who are beginning to convert. Instead of being ordered to convert to Islam, instead, a lot of the Islamic peoples are seeing what's going on with the Christians, and they're now joining the Christians. Silver lining? Well, silver lining sometimes come out of the most horrid clouds. And that's what we're seeing right now. It's 958. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. God willing, if the creek don't rise, they'll allow me to do this all over again tomorrow morning between 8 and 10 o'clock. I may have a Hillary joke or two. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I know I'm going to, when I get to the pearly gates, they'll ask me and I'll say, Yeah, I said that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully, I'll still have time to atone. Rush Limbaugh is coming up next. Luckily, Rush has never said anything bad about a woman anywhere. <clears throat> That's why he uh, he's, he's not successful. <laughs> He'll be here from uh, 10 o'clock until 1 o'clock. Following the 1 o'clock news from Fox, it's Sean Hannity. Following the news from Fox at 4 o'clock, it's Glenn Beck. And, of course, Dave Ramsey tonight, right here on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio1310.com.